With a big surprise credit scene and an ingenious twist, the Enola Holmes sequel is loaded with hidden clues and bonus Sherlock Easter eggs. yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm explaining why we could well be getting a new Sherlock spin-off, plus all the little details I spotted in the movie you might have missed. Spoilers ahead of course, so take care. By the end of the movie, Enola exposes a conspiracy that Mr. Lyne and Lord McIntyre have been covering up the deaths of workers at the match factory from white phosphorus poisoning and blaming it on typhus. However, there was a clue to what was really going on very early in the film, when a girl with a disfigured jaw was turned away from the factory. This was a real-life condition that afflicted workers in the matchstick industry at the time, and was known as Fossy Jaw. And there's another early clue to this conspiracy when Enola breaks into Mr. Lyon's office and discovers a box of non-toxic red matches rather than the white matches being made on the factory floor. So it looks like he wasn't willing to even risk using the new white matches himself, but he'd let his workers breathe in their fumes all day. Also, notice how the original red matchbox sold for two pennies, whereas the white matches sell for half the price, a big hint to how much cheaper the white phosphorus really was. Matches, only a penny a box. The next big twist comes when we discover that McIntyre's secretary, Miss Troy, is Sherlock's nemesis Moriarty. If you spotted the Moriarty clue when she revealed her full name to Enola at the ball, give yourself a pat on the back. Mira Troy, private secretary to Lord McIntyre. But what you might have missed was an even sneakier clue earlier on, when Sherlock reveals a critical piece of information about the mastermind behind the string of unauthorised money transfers he's been investigating. A week before the first transfer, there was a break-in at the Treasury office by a man in a taper crown hat. Notice that the first time we see Miss Troy, she's the only person wearing a tapered crown hat. That means it narrows as it goes up, whereas the other characters' hats are untapered, in other words their hats go up straight. Talk about keeping Moriarty's identity under her hat. If you turn the movie off as soon as the credits began, you'll have missed a crucial bonus mid-credits scene. In the scene, Sherlock is puffing on his pipe, ready to meet his sister for their 4pm Thursday appointment, but she's arranged for John Watson to turn up instead. Sherlock had told Enola that she could be his flatmate, but she turned down his offer in order to keep working independently of her famous brother. So instead, she told Dr. Watson that Sherlock was looking for a flatmate, because remember, she said to her brother that she didn't think he should be alone so much. No one should be alone all the time. Friend would do you well. It looks like this could be setting up a potential spin-off movie or series for Henry Cavill's Sherlock. I know a lot of fans would like to see this, and it could be a good way for both Millie Bobby Brown and Cavill to get plenty of room to focus on their own characters in separate movies, while also crossing paths from time to time. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and leave a thumbs up if you'd like to see this happen. And with Sherlock's increased screen time in the sequel, we get even more Sherlock Easter eggs. The film's production team really went to town designing the look and feel of 221B Baker Street. They wanted to show how this Sherlock is a slightly obsessive collector, and his untidy bachelor's pad is full of skeletons of rare beasts, geological specimens, fossils, insects, microscopes and magnifying glasses. There's also a little tortoise figure on Sherlock's floor, holding down some papers, which feels like a nod to Sherlock's turtle Clyde in the CBS series Elementary, and perhaps also to this little moment from the TV show. I'm pretty sure you shouldn't use Clyde as a paperweight. Sherlock's famous violin is also prominently featured in the room, and he uses it briefly when he plays the tune to a clue Enola found on May's body. A famous fiddle. And there's an amusing little interplay between Lestrade and Sherlock when he comes across Sherlock's pipe. Take it. Take it, I can't. Perhaps I can. The iconic pipe was teased in the first film with this picture of him puffing on it. This is actually an 1891 sketch published in The Man with the Twisted Lip, with Henry Cavill's face overlaid on the original image. At the beginning of the movie, Enola is struggling at her newly opened detective agency while her brother's fame continues to rise. <laughs> in the case of the Brixton corpse. This is a shout out to the very first Sherlock Holmes book, A Study in Scarlet, where he investigates a murder in Brixton. 
Enola's potential clients won't take her seriously because of her gender and age, and she can't even get her due credit for the case she solved in the first movie. Tewksbury case? Well, that was Sherlock Holmes. That was Sherlock Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes, wasn't it? She's even mistaken for a secretary at one point, which is an Easter egg to the original Enola Holmes novels, where she had to masquerade as a secretary in order to pursue her vocation. When Bessie comes to Enola for help to investigate her missing sister, she shows Enola's newspaper ad for her detective agency, Missing Persons Found. This is a hat tip to how in the books, Enola refers to herself as a scientific perditorian, a title she made up from the Latin word perditus, meaning lost, or as Enola puts it, I am a finder of lost souls. By the way, the little toy that Enola dropped just before Bessie came into the agency is Dash, Enola's pet toy from the first movie. Movie, which Sherlock brought to her when she was stuck at finishing school, and which she also left as a clue to Sherlock at the very end of the first film. You had a pine cone wrapped in wool, dragged it with you wherever you went, calling it Dash. Hidden in the newspapers that keep popping up are some great secret jokes and details. When Enola talks about teaching a dog to sit, the movie cuts to an advert for Dr. Pavlov's patented Pooch Persuader, approved by Socks the Wonder Dog. This is an amusing reference to physiologist Ivan Pavlov's discovery that he could condition dogs to salivate at the sound of a bell by ringing a bell whenever they were shown a plate of food. After a while, the dogs associated the bell sound with food and salivated even if they weren't brought any food. These principles of classical conditioning are popularly known as Pavlov's dog. By the way, if you pause here, you'll see that Socks the Wonder Dog is actually a regular performer at the Paragon Theatre, where Sarah and May used to work. And if you pause the film right at this point, you can also spot an advert for a crazy contraption called an electropathic belt, which promises to cure weak and languid feelings, nervousness and rupture, and corpulence and general debility. Amazingly, this isn't a made-up joke for the movie, but a real device that was sold in Victorian London by the Medical Battery Company. In fact, electric belts and other pseudo-medical devices were widely promoted around the time Enola Holmes is set, and they were touted as being able to treat a vast array of illnesses and conditions. A huge expose was later run in the Pall Mall Gazette, the newspaper that features in the movie and which also had previously run numerous ads for the very same belt. And if you watch all the way through the movie's fancy credits, you'll find some more hidden in-jokes and easter eggs for the filmmakers and crew. There's an advert for Brown and Brown Fine Confectionery, with a photo of Millie Bobby Brown and her dad Robert Brown, both producers on the movie. And Springer's silver fountain pens, fine writing implements for the scholar and scribe, is a reference to Nancy Springer who wrote the original Enola Holmes Mysteries book series. There's an ad for Nutchins Silver Nitrate Studios on the credit for director of photography Giles Nutchins, appropriately enough given that silver nitrate is a chemical used to make film stock. And Millie Bobby Brown's sister Paige gets a shout out via Brown's Book Binders, which might also be a reference to how it was Paige who originally proposed the idea of Millie playing the part of Enola on screen after she discovered the Enola Holmes books. And if you'd like to discover the biggest changes made from the Enola Holmes books for the movies and how they made Henry Cavill Sherlock a lot more sympathetic, tap here to watch that video or follow the link in the video description. So what did you think of Enola Holmes 2 and are you hyped up to see more of Henry Cavill's Sherlock with Watson? Let me know what you think below and if you enjoyed this video don't forget to leave a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and notification bell to get more videos just like this. Thanks for enjoying this movie with me and hope you have a marvellous movie loving week. Yippee ki movie lovers!